two different machines. So for any kind of unit test, it doesn't matter what you're using for unit test, you're going to do something consistently and then verify the result. Right? And so the first question comes up, can I actually do it consistently? Right? Right? And I, I think that's the first part that you're talking about, which is what, you know, so if you cannot do something in a consistent manner, you, you basically can't. Right? Yeah. Um, now math allows you to be consistent even if the different machines are different because you can inject your math. Right. Um, badly named framework. <laughs>
so when that fails, you're, it's either going to blow up, and that's mostly what Carl was doing in his demonstrations. He was just letting it blow up. He was catching it, but then he was just shutting down. Um, that usually happens when you ask for the part that math can't give you. So if you ask for a car, then it's going to blow up. If you ask for a collection of all the cars, and one of the cars is unusual, it's not going to blow up because of that. It's just that car just not going to be there. Um, they call that stable composition. And it's a good thing in uh, some certain scenarios where you have third parties working that are working with your plugins, and you don't want them to screw up your thing. You just want their thing with this patch to just disappear. But I don't. I mean, I I'm, I don't personally do it. Work with third parties, um, so I'm just using it to compose an app where I already know everything that should be there. Which for me, it's kind of annoying sometimes, right? I want it to just die because that lets me know that. Yeah. And if I'm telling you that it's failing. Yeah, and so again, well it is telling you that it is failing. No, it's not. Not that it's succeeded. Well, not if, like, like, again, like, not if you want a couple, right? right. So if you say, give me a car, you go to the car dealership and you say, give me a car, and he brings out a car with a couple, but you're like, no, I wanted a car with a couple. So if you say, but it's still a car, you're saying, I am not buying it, that's it. So um, that's the wrong behavior change. That's the other failure change. So you, you want to be able to pick a cup somewhere, but you can't. So you don't have the right car. And but if you ask for the car and it has no motor, then that just dies. It, that's what's going to be an exception. It's going to swallow the exception of cup holders being missing or cup holders that are, you know, they don't close right or whatever. It's just going to swallow those. And that one. So. Now, I thought of this car idea a little bit late in the process. After I'd already written a lot of code about pizzas. So, <laughs> so, so, I mean, I was actually kind of, it was kind of a writer's block thing. I was kind of hurting for an idea in the beginning. You know, so I was looking through the design pattern, the head first design pattern, and like the factory part was all about pizzas. So I was like, okay, let me just start writing for pizzas. And then later, I was like, you know what? This whole car idea is. So mostly we're going to be trying to compose this pizza factory in the examples that, that we did. And it's, it, the pizza factory itself is fairly stable because it wants these pizza makers. And a better name for them would have been recipes. So just think of like a pizza maker make, knows, knows how to make cheese pizza or knows how to make pepperoni pizza. And so again, going back to the thing of the behavior, if I ask for a cheese pizza, I want a cheese pizza. You know, if I'm expecting to deliver a pizza factory to my little Caesars that knows how to make pizza, then if it doesn't make cheese pizza, it's not behaving right. So this thing will always show up, but it may not always do what you want it to do. And then in the pizza makers themselves, I have some examples of things that just don't show up and things they blow up. So um, we're going to go ahead and look at some of these. I'm going to try and flip back and forth between the PowerPoint and the code. Um, the first thing you might do is, is look in the debugger. So I've set this up using uh, my pizza project here. I've set it up using basically tests. We use MS test because I'm not approving up for anything else. Um, and we'll see some approval tests in there for some of them. On some of them, I didn't bother to make the, the master copy. I just wanted to show us the output. So I'm just kind of, in some cases, I actually approve some things so that you can actually see like a test passing, but 
you have this weird unit test, you didn't get your pizza that you wanted, so you start wondering how you're going to figure out why it, it didn't show up. So the first thing you know you might do, you probably already know just from running your test that you didn't get an exception, but we'll just go ahead and just use the express one. Um, run, and so you run your test, and it passes because you know this one would show us the exception that it threw an exception that didn't. So we're already in a situation where you know we know something's wrong because we're not getting my pizza, but Mac isn't telling us anything about it because this is like wrong behavior. So you might just go ahead and look in the debugger and try and figure that one out. So we'll just stop right here when we get to thinking the host. So there's one part in there, which is just the pizza factory itself. And you know, you can keep drilling down. And so you you know, okay, you know that it wanted to import some stuff. You're looking, you know, this is like getting kind of like we're going pretty deep. And now we're starting to get things that don't fit on the screen. And you know, if you're doing this without even using Watch, you know, you move your mouse, it all disappears. You gotta drill down again, it's kind of a pain. So, this is definitely not my favorite one, but if it's there in the box, right? And so, you can easily see already that there's only one part, you know that's it's wrong, right? Because you need to have some kind of recipe to make, should be at least something else. Um, so, that might give you a clue, and then you realize, you know, that, that you're
So, of course, like any any um, thought, or any anything running in the command line, you get only up into the eighty columns to work with, right? So you can type it into a file, and that might make it a little easier to read. Um, you can change the eighty. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you can change the eighty. But. So it starts with this WPF shell, and it's also a little bit less cranky about um, the, the CPU thing I was talking about before. It actually doesn't seem to care about that. It is kind of um, sensitive to pipe load errors, and I'll talk about those a little bit more too, because um, that's probably the second. After you get your basic composition problems out of the way, pipe load errors are going to be So we're going to go into the same directory, our demos directory, that we were looking at with Netflix. And let's go ahead and grab everything. And so this is, again, the exact same information we're seeing on the command line. Just a little prettier, right? So there's our import, or the part that we found. This is what it's exporting for us. 
So, the, the only problem really with those guys, they tell you what you need to know, right? You can pretty quickly figure out that a chain of events occurred, but that one was pretty flat. There's really like only one import, you know? I mean, the pizza factory is always going to compose. The, but the pizza maker, the pepperoni pizza maker only wanted one thing. And if that gives us that exception, it's, it's going to actually tell us the truth for once. It's going to say, I couldn't get the pizza. And that's true, because it was a shallow composition, right? Um, when we get to map uh, two, I'll show you. Um, I, I kind of extended a little so I could kind of prove that it was actually going all the way down and giving us the real root cause. So we should finally get an exception with this guy. Uh, constraints that we got with the exception, right? 
in this demo, I was asking for the pepperoni pizza maker in order to get the exception. Because in that one, if I ask from the factory and I do the same thing, the, the exception doesn't bubble up by default, right? It gets swallowed because that's, that's a broken pizza, right? But we do see it when we do the composition diagram. Okay? And it's not hard to set this up. So you can see that our pizza factory is there, and it's satisfied by the cheese pizza maker, but it's not. But the pepperoni pizza maker is unsatisfied. Right? So it's similar to visual methods, um, just just in text form. And then all your problems with your primary rejection are up here. So you can see that I've taken a reference to that diagnostic. And then the magic happens down here, where we're always almost creating, I mean, we're always creating a catalog for more than that. And we're always putting that catalog in a container. But we take one more step to do the diagnostic, is we move up the uh, instance of the composition itself, and we give it the catalog in the hub. And since I did that extra work unnecessarily of copying over the source code in one last time, Expressions and pretty heavy duty queries against those objects, and it tries to instantiate every object that it finds in the catalog. Right? Every part that it finds in the catalog, it tries to instantiate it, tries to pose it. And if it can't, so that's why those exceptions are showing up in the composition diagnostic, because you get those exceptions by asking for that specific part. Right? So it goes ahead and it asks for every part, and then it, um, and then of course it has a whole graph. And Kind of like take you through the, the steps of why it failed. Once we have the composition info for these guys, we bring it back up and we have one other class that we normally use with the diagnostics, and that's the text formatter. And we just give it our composition info, which I just did, you know, in line. It comes out of that function. And we give it a text writer. So using a string writer, could be any other text writer, you know. And of course, you have to have a reference to the diagnostics of our bottom diagnostics library. So that's kind of the tools I have in order to build up an approval test. Um, you can see by step two that we're able to make cheap pizza.
so I went ahead and, well, you know, Paul was telling me, you know, you really need to have meth too in there. It's going to be so great if you, if you do some stuff with meth too. And I was like reading the blog about meth too, and they were basically saying, we've improved diagnostics in meth too, and then it would say, we've improved the formatting of the exceptions, and we've done something, we've given you this option on the container. And I was like, that sounds really lame. I don't like those exceptions, so what do I care how they're formatted, you know? But they were not, well, I was, when I was talking about this, he, he said they were being modest, and they were, because they really, it's not the formatting, they completely, they stopped lying, right? <laughs> so I telling the truth, right? So now, if, if something fails, it's going to give you like three or four messages saying, I couldn't do this because of this, I couldn't do that because of that, I couldn't do this resulting, and finally, I couldn't do this, right? So I just took this to all these projects and I recompiled them against MEF2. And since I happen to have that other library sitting around, so one thing, of course, was the composition diagnostic stuff working because they're compiling against MEF1. So lucky for me, I, I had done all that extra work before, so I recompiled that one. So some of the messages are a little different because it's a slightly different version, but it's still the same basic, um, basic thing. I went ahead and I took my pepperoni pizza maker and I made him want his topics, right? So now my pepperoni pizza maker wants a pepperoni pizza. And the pizza itself wants pepperoni, right? So that's like a kind of maybe a two-step thing, you know. I figured through mathematical induction, induction that would, you know, kind of prove that if, if I can prove it for three steps, then I then we can just assume that it works for four, five, six, or a million. So let's go ahead and look at the default.net exception. Are you recommending we create trees for the name of the No, call is. <laughs> and I'll flip this guy over to the user to read. So you can live with the yellow. Uh, this is the same exception. Remember, it was just a big crushed pile of text with no line breaks before, you know. Now, that same information that all that pile of text was is, is right here. And it's, they've getting rid of all of the extra words and they just kind of made almost a nice little table, right? So, I couldn't find something that matched the constraint that had the, had the contract in pepperoni and it wasn't popping. Now, in the MEF version 1, it said I couldn't get, it would have said I couldn't get a pizza. Right? So it's actually gone two levels deep to tell you it couldn't get a pop, a poppy. Let's see. Um, turn my bit, turn my bit, turn my bit. 
six of them wrote us, right? Uh, and some of them have this extra composition options parameter. And default is the math one behavior, right? Which means, well, if you ask for something, it, and it, it's either it doesn't care, like you don't care about the part because you haven't asked for it yet, or it's part of a collection, it's just going to kind of silently reject those, right? Stable composition. Or you can disable the stable composition using the disable not rejection, meaning don't be quiet, throw, re throw the exception. I don't know what this guy does. It's not having anything to do with diagnostics as far as I know. Um, there's actually a lot of cool stuff in that too um, that I kind of like saw and like would love to talk about but have nothing to do with that with diagnostics. Um, and I think this thread safe thing was kind of, it was there before, but it was just like a boolean. There was a it's thread safe a prop, a boolean you can pass in. So if I disable the rejection, then, so if I go back to the default behavior, now, when I was getting the exception with MEP1, I was asking for a pepperoni pizza maker, right? And it was throwing that exception. So I just got that same exception just now, asking for the factor, right? So it's letting me know even earlier, like I wouldn't even get to my approval test if I was doing a whole diagnostic thing, because I couldn't even make my, I couldn't even make it, right? So, just to show you that we have the, you know, that one behavior, right? And it should just, it should just complete without showing us anything. Because it's just swallowed the exception. Yeah, so, okay, I've swallowed it. If I'm working alone and I know that I'm the kind of like, or I'm working on a small team and I know that we're the only people writing these parts and we know what we want in there and we're just using it to put things together, then we probably want to do this. And even on the blog entries they say, if you're not working with third parties, this is the recommended. Right? And 
telling me that it's, it's telling me that it ignores something. That's not my definition of ignoring something. And so we might, I might have like you know buried in here. We would see you know there's also some different ones. Like that one doesn't really work with generic open generics, right? So it's going to say that it didn't do anything with that type because those are open generic. Um, but you see some higher priority messages like warnings or errors in here that had those exceptions dumped out. So, so that's something you can continue to do. Um, again, there's no no analysis, right? You, then you're gonna have to figure it out, right? So that's what you use for free. Um, and when that too comes out, then you do get the analysis which should show up in the line as well. So I mean it makes sense. So the last part of this is um, just kind of like a laundry list. Um, I can send this to you if you want, right? But it's just kind of like a laundry list or a checklist of things you might want to look into. There's always the dumb things to start with, right? Did I actually remember to make my, my classes in the math parts, right? Did I put that attribute there? Is my catalog really what I think it is? You notice a lot of times, like in examples, that there'll be an aggregate catalog, and one of them will be a directory catalog, and the other one will be an assembly catalog, basically referring to like the host. Right? That's the way Carl was doing it. Um, you might ask, why didn't the host show up? Right? It's in the bin directory, isn't it? So shouldn't it have been found in the directory catalog? Um, one of the things I learned when I was preparing for this was that by default the directory catalog only looks at DLLs. So the host doesn't show up in some AC and you can tell it to look for AFDs, but I don't think you can tell it to look for AFDs and DLLs. So you kind of end up having to make two catalogs, one for AFDs and one for DLLs. But again, if you have some other DFC that you know has parts in it that you want and that's not your host, you'll have to take that extra step of reference telling it that your directory catalog needs to look at the There's all the different things having to do with the contrast, right, and the metadata. If you have metadata on your import, then all that metadata has to be on your export too, right? And they have to be the same type. So, you know, one does not equal one, right? Because one's a string and one's an integer. So you can't have like your metadata called priority
mention of it in, in this back in that blog post I think that I'm basing a lot of this information off of, um, that there's a loading context, which is like your it's the gap and it's like your directory and below it, right? So you can't really like go over like to some other directory without doing some extra configuration to tell .NET, not really map, but .NET that it's okay to get assemblies from there. You know? So, you know, that's something to think about. It seems like that scenario is possible, but you know, you start getting into really the reflection and the map domain. Like so you're like leaving map to, to just general .NET prop problems that stop your your assembly from loading. I mean it's not gonna work with map, right? So it's not gonna work with .NET at all. Any other kind of questions? So, um, <laughs> all right, so I think that that's pretty much it. I mean, we have like five more minutes. Do you guys have any, any specific questions? Because I know he's an expert, but I can have had some experience with this stuff. Do you have a process when you're loading something in the map that you test? Huh? Yeah. Um, my biggest Thing. My biggest annoyance with map is, um, and the reason why I, I would still use di composite diagnostics and approval tests after that two comes out, is there is no cardinality that says one or more. Right? You have zero or more, zero or one, or exactly one. Right? So again, the pizza factory, it, it's kind of something that I, I run into a lot, right? I have some service, right? I have this generic, or not really generic, Sense, but it's just kind of a dumb service list, right? I want to run something into Windows Service. And then I'm 
down and knowing, knowing like, I guess I, I asked because I want to know if you took care of this because you had to. It was or, a reaction.